Well, hey, all you wiretappers out there, back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. Another little uh, special, a little research I did myself. Uh, Anthony Tony Mira. You may have heard of him. He is the guy that brought Joe Pistone in first. He, Pistone had done some under, undercover work. He got involved with some kind of a stone auto thing, I think, down in Florida. But he's gone up to New York, and he's hanging out in joints, and, and he gets the attention of this Tony Mira. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about Tony Mira. There wasn't a lot out there about him, uh, but he was uh, a born and bred mafia legacy. He grew up on the Lower East Side. Uh, he was uh, ended up being a captain or a capo in the Bonino crime family. Now, uh, he, he's really, that is that is his claim to fame as he introduced Joe Pistone, a.k.a. Donnie Brasco, into the Bonino uh, crime family. Now, his parents were Albert and Millie Mira. Uh, I think her maiden name was Imbarado. Uh, grew up in the Lower East Side. He he had he was a nephew of a Bonanno family capo regime named Alfred Imbarado. Uh, he was an uncle to a Bonanno soldier named Joseph D'Amico. Uh, he was a cousin to uh, Bonanno capo Richard Cantarella. Uh, who had a brother who named Frank Cantarella and uh, a, another brother named Paul Cantarella. So he was born and bred to the Bonanno crime family. Uh, grew up in a place called Knickerbocker Village. He lived in the same building as a man, a young guy, kid named Benjamin Lefty Ruggiero, who will become famous as, you know, the Lefty Ruggiero. Uh, as he grows up into his own, he uh, owns and operates something called the Lunchbox Luncheonette over in Little Italy on Man Man in Manhattan. It was not far from a bar and a social club that was owned by Lefty Ruggiero. Uh, they're both being associates and will go into the Bonanno family. Uh, his relative, uh, Joseph D'Amico and Albert Imbarato and Richard Canarella were uh, they become involved in a banano scheme uh, as a racketeering scheme with the new york post distribution center but mira he always charted his own way as he progressed through his mafia career in the banano family carmine galente took notice of it of him now carmine galente or lilo or the cigar uh if you remember i did a show on him if you want to go back and, and listen to that uh, he was a man that Joe Bonanno uh, selected to run the huge heroin supply business that uh, Bonanno family got into. Uh, and this goes all the way back to a meeting over in, in Italy where this is all set up after World War II. Um, Galente then becomes the guy that is responsible for the American end of bringing heroin in, which starts, of course, in Turkey as part of it, the French connection. Uh, that, that was another family's operation, uh, I believe. But uh, they had the same route, start down Turkey through Sicily or uh, France and Port of Marseille, maybe bring it to, but uh, the Bananos brought it up to Montreal, because that they had uh, the Rizzuto uh, family, the the Montreal family really was was like a crew of the Bonanno family, and Galente was their guy was a guy from the United States that went up to Montreal and and made sure all that ran right. And, and Galente was uh, uh, he was a guy he was just like this guy he saw in Tony Mira a kindred spirit I'll tell you right now because Galante would kill quickly and without remorse and he saw that Tony Mira was a angry violent man who would kill quickly without remorse didn't have many friends uh, some speculate that Tony Mira murdered over a hundred men in his life now that's you know that's a lot of guys so I don't know about that but he had a reputation as a murder killer uh, by the time he reached his 50s, he'd spent more than half of his life in and out of federal penitentiaries. But he was Galante's top killer. Galante will get killed, of course, uh, 
during the 70s, I believe. And uh, Mira was able to survive that and come out on the other side. Um, but it's been said that even among mob guys, Tony Mira had a reputation as a as really as a psychopathic killer. And he was one of the most feared gangsters in Manhattan or in five families. And he was a killing machine with no soul, it's been said. Some of his uh, contemporaries in the mob uh, would describe him as a crazed. And they said he exhibited unpredictable mood swings. Nobody liked to be around him. You had to walk on eggshells when you're around Tony Mira. Now, he worked directly under Bonanno Capo Michael Zafferano. Coupled with his uh, violent and unstable demeanor, Tony Mira backed up on the streets and in the bars what his reputation was with just with his size. He was a monster of a dude in that world. He was six foot three, weighed 265 pounds. He was not big and fat. He had huge, big, powerfully developed muscular arms and chest, and he had huge hands, and he could intimidate any man with his size alone. And he was also known, you know, from the penitentiary, they do a lot of bench pressing in the penitentiary, a lot of wake work that he had enormous, enormous strength with his arms and chest and legs. Uh, somebody even said he had Superman like strength and, and in prison, he could bench press over 600 pounds. Guys had seen him pick up a grown man with one hand by the neck. Just pick him up and hold him up against the wall as he intimidated him. And and the story went around that he once killed a guy who was a decent sized guy, six foot, 200 pounds, and punched him in the face only five times and, you know, did him in. So he was bigger than life when it came to uh, physical intimidation. Another thing about Tony Mira is he never showed any interest in friendships with other men or romantic relationships with women. Now, in regard to romantic relationships, he was a voracious womanizer, but he liked group sex with multiple women. So we have to assume there's a lot of prostitutes came in, involved in this, or probably he had some hold over a pimp, was getting money from him and porn business or whatever. And, and it's probably one of the deals they provide women for him. There's probably a whole other story there that, that I don't know and I couldn't find. Uh, you guys probably have all noticed there are certain women who are attracted to abusers. Even though they get treated poorly, they still are attracted. They'll get rid of, they'll get away from one abuser. Next thing you know, they're they're tied up with another one. So that he had a never-ending stream of women. They seem to be attracted to him, a certain kind of woman. Uh, they said that his many girlfriends would range from bimbos to movie stars. Uh, but when he wasn't hustling them, uh, which you know how that goes, he's real nice at first. Pretty soon he's abusing them physically and berating them with insult, insults. And uh, another interesting tidbit on his about his personal life, he never drank alcohol. He only drank ginger ale. Now, go figure that one. But I think he was tough enough. Nobody ever questioned him, uh, you know, about not drinking. And now, as I said before, Tony Mira didn't seem to have any inclination to become pals with anybody he always maintained a distance between even his fellow his closest fellow mobsters and his crew and just like and same thing with these relatives the uh, Cantarella brothers he, he always remained close to his biological mother he saw her he visited her every Sunday he always drove her to mass mother's day and birthdays and things like that he always took care of his mother which you know that's kind of the <laughs> the uh, uh, stereotype, I guess, if you will. And one, one relative, his cousin, Joseph D'Amico, and I saw one other place where that was his uncle, but I think it was his cousin. They were contemporaries in the mob, and I think about the same age. He did stay kind of close to D'Amico, and that'll kind of be a mistake in the end. Now, Tony Mera was the first real mafia contact that FBI agent Joe Pistone made at the beginning of this successful infiltration of the mob and particularly of the Bonanno crime family. Um, he had made a connection to an associate for the Colombo family, and he'd been involved in a stolen car operation. And with kind of playing on that, it's that pedigree. Started showing up at mob bars in Manhattan and fronting himself off as a thief who specialized in jewelry. And the thing about coming off as a jewel thief, a uh, bureau can always buy a whole lot of, of decent jewelry, 
And I mean, they'll put the money into it. They'll put a hundred thousand dollars in this thing, you know. So you come buy, you know, buy the guy eight, ten thousand dollars worth of jewelry, and then he goes out and, and you know, hey, this is hot man, and he's got it for sale for you know ten thousand dollars worth of jewelry. You can get for you know twenty five hundred dollars or less. Uh, and and so they're they're greedy and they're cheap. Mob guys are always greedy and always cheap. And Tony Mera and uh, Lefty Rosario, of course. Or, or uh, did not violate that stereotype. So he's running around with this jewelry, and, and the bartender where he's hanging out, I think it was Camelo's or something, he notices it, and he gets introduced to Mira, and, you know, Mira gets it, and then Mira kind of showing him off. This is his guy, you know, his, uh, his, his new guy that he's making money off of, to Benjamin Lefty Rosario. Now, when you see Lefty Rosario, Referred to as Benjamin. I noticed that when I was researching this, like, who the hell's Benjamin Rosario? Well, that's Lefty. Um, he and Lefty seemed to hit it off, and and uh, Lefty gave Pistone kind of a semi regular job handling a slot machine route that he had going out and collecting the money. Now, kind of shortly after this, these relationships were all made, the feds indicted. Tony Mira for drug trafficking. This is 1975. He went on the run, didn't last very long. A few months later, FBI caught him. He ended up going to jail, went to prison, federal prison for eight and a half years. Uh, and to under, illustrate, I guess, how long Joe Pistone was undercover when Mira got out of jail. He didn't do a full eight and a half, I'm sure. I don't remember exactly what he did. Uh, but by the time he got out of jail, Donnie Brasco, a.k.a. Joe Pistone, had become so close with Lefty Ruggiero that he was working with him all the time. He was kind of like working under him. And, and Ruggiero, you know, in that world, you, you're you owned by somebody. You're with somebody. So Mira got out. He wanted Brasco back because the guy could make him some money. Mira went to the bosses and he argued that Brasco belonged to him and not Ruggiero. Ended up with a sit down with two or three sit downs over the Donnie Brasco situation. Now, get go figure that. I mean, the FBI, they must have just been all over themselves with they must have been giddy with this. There you got two mob guys arguing over their agent who's going to get him and bring him in. Uh, in the end, Rosario won and Brasco, Donnie Brasco belonged to him. Now, I have to wonder if Rosario <laughs> wasn't a little worried. I mean, the guy was. He was mafia born and bred, and there are certain rules. So he was pretty, he was a made guy by this time, uh, but he probably did make a pretty dangerous enemy. But hell, uh, Tony Mara had plenty of enemies. Plenty of people hated him, and he probably hated plenty of people. Uh, but he beat Tony Mara. During this whole thing, Mara even went so far, and it's like, you know, if I can't have him, then I'm going to break him. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take my football and go home. He tried to accuse the Donnie Brasco of stealing two hundred fifty thousand dollars for in some sort of situation. I don't didn't really go into that. Uh, the bosses found Pistone innocent of of this, or Donnie Brasco innocent of that allegation. So you know the rest is history. He goes on and and uh, works with uh, with Lefty Ruggiero. And they do a lot of things. He introduces him to a lot of people, and they travel around. They go down and. Florida and do some stuff. And they they go to Milwaukee and try to help an undercover agent out in Milwaukee and meet with Frank Ballesteri. It was, it was really amazing, as we all know now, what what they were able to do. By 1980, uh, Tony Merritt's capo, Michael Zaffarino, had died. And uh, Mara ends up getting promoted, and he takes over the Bonanno family pornography empire all the money's coming in from the porn business which was huge in in new york city in in the 80s uh during that time just go watch that uh, uh you know that show the 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 deuce about the mob and the porn business in the 80s there's a lot of money coming in uh He's now working under one of the zips that uh, Carmine Galente had imported uh guy from Sicily, born in Sicily, grew up in Sicily, and he brought these guys over to help him. And he, he thought he could trust these guys. Of course, they ended up helping helping kill Galante in the end. But, you know, there are no friends in the mob, as everybody knows. But he, uh, 
Cesare Bonaventre. He's the one that, that now Tony Mare is working for. During the 1980s, Tony Mare made his presence known all over Little Italy and Manhattan, the bars and everything. He has a vending machine route. He had slot machines, peanut vending machines, arcade machines, pinball machines. And he had them in stores, luncheonettes, social clubs, after hours joints, bars, any place. And, and, you know, I don't imagine when Tony Mara came in and wanted your, his machines and your joint that you probably resisted too much, unless you already had another Bob guy who had it in there. And then you went to your Bob guy. They had to sit down and decide who's, who got that spot. Now, slot machines would always be installed in the back room or the basement because they were illegal in New York City. And, and and he he was a guy that he he was the one that kept the key to the coin boxes, and so he would go around once a week or so, probably depending on the machine and how how much it was being used. And he'd be the only one that would open the machines, and he'd give the store owner his cut of the profits. It said that he was making uh, about two grand a week just off his slot machines. Uh, he was involved in many other strong arm schemes and extorting money. He he always cheated everybody. You know, he was cheating these bar owners. He, he was just like, just like this raging bull that took what he wanted in New York City, unless it was another mob guy that already had it. That was the only rules that he abided by. As Lefty Rosario told Joe Pistone, he said, you know, it's great. He said, you can go out and kill somebody and it's okay. As long as it's not the wrong person. It's okay. In, the, in their world, they have their own set of rules, and, and that's the only ones that they really abide by. After he surfaced, Joe Pistone would, would say that Tony Mara was the nastiest, most intimidating man he met in his seven years undercover. Now, due to his violent and unpredictable behavior, his demeanor, he, he didn't want any close friends. He didn't have any close friends. But Stone said he never made small talk. He'd only talk about criminal activity, and and he was unpredictable. He said one day you might say, you know, when you're kind of like meeting him at a bar or something, and he might say, well, you know, how's your mom, Tony? So one day he might say, okay. Next day he might say, well, what the fuck makes you so curious about that? That's none of your business. So you know, who knows. The guy was, but he was successful as a mobster. And, you know, if you can, if you can control even a little bit a guy like that and he's making you money, you know, you just let him go as long as you're not threatening. He's not threatening to you. And, and he did understand the rules, I believe. Well, heck, uh, other, <laughs> well, heck, other Bob guys used to even warn Joe Pistone, Donnie Brasco, that, you know, if you ever get in an argument with this guy, with Mira, you better stay at an arm's length because he'll stab you. Now, history behind that is ever since he was a young man, he always carried a kind of a semi long bladed knife. You know, you get caught, get popped with a gun, especially in New York City, you're going to jail. So he'd always carry a knife and, and he was not afraid to use it. They said, you know, even as a teenager, if you got in a fight with, uh, Tony Mira, you're going to end up being stabbed. So he's always, he always was ready to use that. Everybody knew it. So Joe Stone stayed an arm length away. You know, I would imagine probably everybody did. Uh, he was really regarded as a loose cannon and a psychopath, but a psychopath they felt like they could control and, and make money off of. He was working under Cesar Bonaventure, and he kept him around, kept him alive, protected him because he was generating a lot of cash money. Uh, like I said he he was on the streets every day, and and he'd even bragged to Pistone that he'd made it millions and millions for the family, and you know even as much as ten million dollars. Now you know that's a lot of money, but he he had made a lot of money for the family. That was his life. Uh, he was known to cheat everybody he did business with. He never picked up a check. Uh, he never paid for any goods or services that he got. He could, he could intimidate or browbeat or, or cheat somebody out of it. Uh, he liked to get stuff, as the police say, on the arm. You know, that's where the policeman has has his patch or something on his arm, and they give it to you free. Uh, he, you know, as I said before, he's known to be very violent with women. There's one story that even murdered one of his mistresses after she confessed to him that that. Uh, She'd had a baby and it was probably his and she'd had an abortion. Uh, Left Zero once told Joe Pistone that Mira was always abusing somebody. And that really was a big problem. If he wasn't such a big moneymaker, he'd been gone a long time ago. Uh, 
you know, his fellow mobsters hated Mira so much that when this whole deal fell, Joe Pistone surfaced and they started, the word started getting around. He was really an FBI agent. Mira just went directly into hiding. He didn't even try to go to anybody and negotiate, say, hey, you know, I didn't know, you know, I would somebody duped me. It was that Lefty Ruggiero. It was all on him. He knew nobody was going to stand up for him. And, and, and he just went into hiding. He ended up going into jail for a short period of time and coming back out during this time. Uh, all these guys, Sonny Black, Napoletano, and Lefty Ruggiero were on the firing line as well as Tony Mirror. Anybody that was involved in kind of saying this Donnie Brasco was a good guy and promoting him, uh, they were all on the firing line and they got Sonny Black Napoletano pretty quickly. Lefty, they never got. He ended up going to the penitentiary, getting cancer. Uh, you know, I have a uh, show out there where Steve St. John, my friend Steve St. John, was was in the penitentiary with Lefty Ruggiero and got to know him pretty well. Even talked to him on the phone several times after both of them got out and uh, got Joe Pistone to get on the phone and tell a little bit about Lefty. And and Steve told us about being in penitentiary with him. He's kind of an interesting guy, I'll tell you what. Tony Mara, though, he did not avoid it. His friend, his only friend, even among all his relatives, and his only guy that he kind of let close, the only guy that could set him up with this Joseph D'Amico, his cousin. And he lured him to a parking garage on North Monroe Street and West Street in Lower Manhattan, if you know where that is. Now, I'm not sure where that is. Um, Mary just got out of the penitentiary again at that time and keeping a low profile and wasn't really on the streets. And and it was really it was hard to set up. And D'Amico was the only person he trusted. So he agreed to meet him there. And what's interesting is his other relatives, uh, Richard Canarella, and uh, he had an uncle, Alfred Imbarato, who were part of the Bonanno family. They jiggered for him. They kept watch outside the garage. And D'Amico got in Amir's car. He had a, a burgundy Mercedes S class and pull a gun, just pull the gun out and just start shooting him in the head. Now you'd want to do it pretty quick. I mean, really quick, because if Mara got his hands on you, he would he probably just broke that guy's neck sitting there. Uh, he was discovered by a passing policeman, somebody driving through the garage, thought he was a vagrant sleeping in somebody's car. Uh, blood drained out of his head down into his body. There was so much blood, all of his blood pooled up inside his clothing. He said his yellow boxer shorts uh, appeared to be red, which is kind of an interesting little detail that came out of the uh, coroner's report. Uh, I don't know. I don't have any yellow boxer shorts myself, but, but he did, you know, he's a weird dude. <laughs> like that group sex with prostitutes. I mean, that says something right there. Uh, Cantarella had actually been Richard Cantarella had actually been the one that was given the contract by Joseph Massino, who Joe Massino shortly after this, not too much long after this, will go in and testify himself. And that's how we know a lot of these details. Normally, these details of a hit like this, you'll never, ever know. And it was directly as a retaliation for the Donnie Brasco infiltration. And there were rumors going around. Of course, you know, when you got an enemy like that, as soon as they see a weakness and they're going to see it, they, they claim that, you know, guys were claiming that he was an informant who had been working for Brasco. And that's how Brasco got in, because he's the first guy really in the Bonanno family that that met Brasco and started introducing him around, introduced him to Lefty. Might be why Lefty avoided it and didn't really go after him. And I think Sonny Black couldn't avoid it because he was, it was his crew. And Sonny Black had really been a big promoter of Donnie Brasco. He's the guy that was proposing that he'd be made, I believe. Um, Merrod had, uh, you know, I mean, he, he just, he, he was impossible to get. But finally, uh, Joseph D'Amico, who came in, He's another one that told the story. And he said, I was the only one that could ever begin to get close to him. So that's the story. Story, Correction. So that's the story of Tony Mirror, the guy that was the most responsible for getting Joe Pistone, a.k.a. Donnie Brasco, into the Bonanno family. Uh, Lefty Ruggiero would have never buddied up to him. 
and Dominic Napolitano would never have allowed him to come around to the social club and be involved in meetings. Probably would never even bought jewelry from him, maybe for a short period of time, but they wouldn't have dealt with him very long, except Tony Mira had brought him in and started to introduce him around. And, and Mira was probably not the sharpest tool in the toolbox. He was a killer. He was a psycho, but I got a feeling talking to him, he was not the sharpest tool in the toolbox. So anyhow, that's the story of Tony Mira, folks. Uh, remember, look out for motorcycles because, you know, I like to ride motorcycles. And if you got any problems with PTSD, if you've been in the service, go to the VA website. They got a hotline. You can find out all you need to know about PTSD. Uh, if you like the podcast or the YouTube podcast, share it, put it on your social media, tell your friends about it. We're trying to build something here. Longest running uh, mob podcast, I think, of all of them. Uh, I'm just, I'm going to be on another kind of a newer Bobcat podcast. I told them, I said, you know, I'm the first guy. You realize that? they like, oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> but it's true. I was the first guy, as far as I can tell. There may be one out there longer. If you know of one that was out there before me, why, well, let me know. Uh, thanks a lot, folks. Uh, thanks a lot, folks. Uh, thanks a lot, folks.